For a decade now, drug cartels have been waging a war for territory along the U.S.-Mexico border. In Mexico, the violence has devastated cities and claimed the lives of nearly 60,000 people. Nuevo Laredo and its sister city, Laredo, Texas, are the crown jewels of smuggling routes into the United States. The largest land border crossing, thousands and thousands of trucks crossing the U.S.-Mexican border every day, thousands of pedestrians crossing. Our geography is what made us really as successful as we've been. Prosperity means you bring in the good, the bad, and the ugly, remember. This is the best place for drug cartels to operate. With billions of dollars at stake, the battle for control of Nuevo Laredo was an all-out war. The city was seized by the Zetas, a ruthless group of ex-commandos who used a mix of tactical warfare and terrifying displays of violence to defeat their rivals. But a more terrifying Zeta tactic is laying waste to an entire generation. The Zetas were recruiting hundreds of children and sending them to the front lines in battles against rival cartels in the Mexican army. These Nino Sicarios, or child assassins, not only witnessed the violence of the drug cartels, they were forced to take part in it. And that's the first place where I've seen people getting executed, people getting burned alive. And that was the first time that I, that I had to shoot somebody that very same night. They took a 13-year-old child, gave him a gun, and told him, it's either you, you shoot him or we're going to kill you. And at 13, that's going to put fear in anybody. Bienvenido a la frontera. Bienvenido a Nuevo Laredo. Es una de las ciudades más peligrosas en México. Aquí estamos en el centro de Nuevo Laredo, donde hay mucho negocio, un lugar próspero. La gente de Nuevo Laredo es gente humilde, gente trabajadora, pero lamentablemente, debido al narco, muchos negocios han tenido que cerrar. Along the U.S.-Mexico border, the violence has affected every aspect of society. Nuevo Laredo is so dangerous that the man guiding us must hide his identity. He fears he could be killed just for talking to us. When you're driving, there are many houses with listones negros, showing that someone in that house has fallecido or has died. Tristemente, muchos de esos casos son jóvenes que han muerto en esta guerra cruel. There are no official numbers for children killed in the violence, but estimates are in the thousands. Five minutes from the border is Casa Ugar Elim, a home for orphans and disadvantaged youth in Nuevo Laredo in the state of Tamaulipas. The facility was founded by Guadalupe Carmona, known to the children who live here as Mama Lupita. Twenty years ago, she opened her doors to provide food and shelter for 15 kids. Today, there are more than 200 children living here. They come to Mama Lupita to escape from the violence and get a hot meal. Siempre llegan con bastante hambre. Ya vemos a niños que andan con dos, tres piezas de pan y son los nuevos. Siempre son los nuevos que comen bastante, bastante. Lo que pongas, lo que tú les des, ellos comen del hambre y la necesidad que tienen. La mayoría de estos niños que están internados en Caso Hogar, la mayoría de esos problemas por, por los problemas del crimen organizado, por la inseguridad que existe en nuestro país. In 2006, the Mexican army came here. They were deployed to battle the Zetas, the most powerful narco gang in Nuevo Laredo. They controlled more than half the city. Our driver remembers their arrival. Cuando los soldados vinieron, tuvieron muchos problemas porque no podían operar 
fácilmente porque tenía todos sus halcones en las calles que estaban diciendo sus ubicaciones. The army began detaining halcones, kids with walkie-talkies who served as lookouts for the Zetas. But soon they were sweeping the streets and picking up any children not in school. Many were never seen again. Comenzaron a matar niños. Niños chiquititos comenzaron a matar que tenían radios. Y ahora lo que pasa es que como los niños los tienen amigos y aunque ellos no tienen nada que ver con el cartel, también como están ahí metiendo la bola, también los soldados se los ha llevado, los ha levantado, los ha desaparecido. Sí hemos visto eh, que han muerto muchos jóvenes a, a manos de, de, de los soldados, quizás porque tienen momentos de pelear, pero pues ya cuando se acercan no son hombres, son niños, son jovencitos. The military denies targeting children, but in 2013, it was reported that in one year, the army detained 473 minors for being part of drug gangs and organized crime. Human rights groups estimate that there are more than 30,000 underage children engaged in drug trafficking, kidnapping, smuggling, extortion, piracy, and murder. Porque son víctimas es por una, pues a veces por unos 100 pesos o 200 o unas papitas o, o dulces o porque les venía a comer. Mexico has a lenient juvenile justice system meant to protect children from harsh punishments. But the drug gangs know this and take advantage of the system. There are children as young as 10 years old put on patrols guarding large portions of the smuggling routes. Vamos aquí es la carretera que te va a piedras negras. Cuando las cosas estaban muy mal, esta carretera se le conoce la carretera de la muerte. Es una de las arterias más grandes. Es una de las carreteras que, que usan mucho los jóvenes narcos. Cuando vienen estos chamaquitos de 10, 11, 13, 15 años, no creo que pasen más de 18 años, y vienen con pistolas a cerrar la carretera, hombres grandes, hechos y derechos, hombres fuertes, que manejan esos trailers, se tienen que rodear enfrente de estos niños, niños con pistolas. Gang members die every day, so these child soldiers are rapidly replenishing the ranks of the narco armies. They can expect to be promoted quickly from lookout to street soldier. The Center for Investigative Reporting found a young man who had joined the Zetas when he was 13 years old. Empecé en una esquina a caer en un carro con gente armada y demás. Pues algo en serio no es juego. Era de que siempre estaba volteando para atrás, checando quién, quién viene, quién no viene, hasta de tus amigos. No pasa si te le caen a la gente y los asustas y la gente te tiene miedo porque andas ahí. He told us he soon began carrying out targeted executions as a sicario or assassin. And before his 17th birthday, he had killed 13 people. Primera vez que pasó, pues sí sentí primero nervios, muchos nervios y, y miedo. Y aunque estuviera drogado, sentía los nervios, la presión. Tan fácil es jalar el gatillo. Entonces, en ese momento que haces eso tú, tu vida cambia pronto. ¿Por qué? Porque ya te manchaste las manos. There are five bridges that span the Rio Grande River between Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, Texas. Whether by train, by truck, in cars or on foot, thousands of people and millions of dollars in commercial goods cross the river every day. We are a transportation town. Nothing more, nothing less, but a transportation town. Our geography is what made us really as successful as we've been. There has been the people that, that cross with goods that are good and goods that are bad. But that has existed in our community forever. This is the best place for drug cartels to operate. It's an easy access once the drugs come into the U.S. to use the IH-35 corridor, the gateway for commercial goods coming from Mexico into the U.S. The largest land border crossing along the southwest border with thousands and thousands of trucks crossing the U.S.-Mexican border every day, thousands of pedestrians crossing a very, very lucrative market. Smugglers had coexisted on this border for years. Violence only affected those involved, and the trade stayed under the radar. But 10 years ago, a new cartel emerged, the Zetas, former commandos who got their start as enforcers for the Gulf Cartel, the group that had controlled this area for years. 
the Zetas were recruited by the Gulf Cartel for one reason and one reason alone. They were all former Mexican military uh, special forces commandos. Soon, the Zetas broke away from their employers and launched a full-out assault on the smuggling routes. They battled two rival cartels for control of Nuevo Laredo, and the city was devastated in the fight. I could never have imagined just how bad it was gonna affect the city of Nuevo Laredo. Whether you're good or bad, you're going to thrive in a community that is thriving. For years, the citizens were respected, the businesses were respected, and so I could not imagine that anyone would be stupid enough to destroy a community while trying to build themselves up. And yet, in fact, they did. They did that, exactly that. The Zetas' military tactics overwhelmed their enemies, and they were now the main rival of Mexico's most powerful criminal organization, the Sinaloa Cartel. They ruled through fear and built their reputation with shocking acts of extreme violence, videotaped and broadcast on the internet, to intimidate their rivals and terrorize the communities they controlled. This aspect of the Zeta brand was being carefully managed by a commander named Miguel Trevino, a man with his own reputation for staging gory executions, he was the organization's promoter and its public image. Trevino was a native of Nuevo Laredo. As a kid, he washed cars for members of the Gulf Cartel and caught the attention of their leader, Osiel Cárdenas, who saw something special in the young Trevino. He was born and raised in Nuevo Laredo. He knows that town inside and out. He knows every nook and, and cranny. He knows the back alleys. He knows the boardrooms. There's nothing he doesn't know. Trevino had family on both sides of the border. As a teenager, he spent most of his years in Dallas, working with local gangs and learning valuable lessons about the economics of the drug business in the United States. He also tried to steer clear of the criminal justice system. Trevino's only brush with the law was an arrest for joyriding. His life in the United States and his time spent in Dallas was extraordinarily important to him. Because as a leader of a cartel in Mexico, you can know everything that there is to know about Mexico, but the market is on the other side of the border. He learned how Americans think. He understood America's insatiable appetite for illicit drugs. I believe he developed a picture in his mind of how to market to that, and, and that's another extremely important piece to all of this because these cartels operate exactly like fortune 100 companies okay and it's all about marketing it's about creating demand it's about creating a diverse product line the zeta's brand part commando and part gangster assassin was also popular in the united states and trevino used it to recruit young boys Bueno, a través de los años, los Zetas sí han utilizado eh, lo que son los medios, lo que son los nuevos medios especialmente, para amedrentar el, la, el, el pueblo y presentar una imagen de un grupo de delincuentes ultra violentos, que sí lo son, eh, que no temían a ninguna autoridad, que en realidad sí temen las autoridades, pero presentan esa imagen de bravura, de machismo, que en pues, la cultura popular en México pegó y tuvo resonancia. Trevino set his sights on cross-cultural kids like himself. Rosalio Reta was another kid from the border. He was born just over the Rio Grande in Laredo, Texas. I used to go to Nuevo Laredo like, to spend time with family. Me, my mom, dad, we used to go spend holidays, Christmas, New Year's, spend a pretty good time on both sides of the border. My town growing up, it was happy before my whole involvement with the, with the Zeta started. In an exclusive interview with the Center for Investigative Reporting, Reta told us that 10 years ago, when he was only 13 years old, he crossed over the bridge looking for adventure and was sucked into the violent world of Miguel Trevino. I went to Nuevo Laredo with one of my friends from my neighborhood. He invited me one time to go eat. He would always brag about that his brother was working for some people in Mexico, some 
big people, like he used to say. When we were eating, he got a phone call that uh, he had to report to somewhere. So we drove, we drove to a little ranch in the outskirts of Nuevo And that's the first place where I've seen people getting executed, people getting burnt alive. Trevino was in the middle of everything. He was the one in charge. I know that just by looking at that person, telling people what to do, where to go. So Miguel Trevino started asking there, who, who was I? He started like trying to intimidate me. And he asked me if I had ever killed somebody. And me not knowing what to do, what was going on around me, I just said, yes. I don't even know why I answered that quite why I said yes. And that was the first time that, uh, that I had to shoot somebody that very same night. Miguel Trevino was recruiting American teenagers for a special project. Reta was going to be part of a team of highly trained assassins operating in the United States. Miguel Trevino took me to a military training camp deep down in Mexico, and then we had to fly there in a helicopter. So it was uh, the original search from the GAFES giving us a training. I received training from any type of assault rifle, handgun, hand grenades, rocket launcher, once he completed his training, Reta was sent back across the border to the United States. And in a safe house in Texas, he was reunited with his childhood friend, Gabriel Cardona. As kids, they spent hours together playing first-person shooter video games. Now, they were trained for the real thing. The Setas were running several Sicario crews on the U.S. side of the border in Laredo. And one of those was the crew that was headed by Gabriel Cardona. And then one of the guys who worked for him was Rosalio Reta, a very young man who had sort of ingratiated himself with the Setas leadership. He was a friend of Cardona's, but had been able to, to sort of befriend high-ranking Setas in Mexico. Reta's ex-wife recalls him describing his close relationship with Trevino as if they were family, like a big brother. He actually told me that he became close with Miguel Trevino. He became real close with the big boss. He trusted him. He gave um, Rosalio the big jobs. He was, he was proud of the work that he did. He basically took him underneath his wing and trained him to be just like him. That's the pitch that they use to young men and more and more, sadly, women who look up to them with almost mythical kind of a status. They're constantly preaching to them that you too could be the next Miguel Trevino. To be like Miguel Trevino is to commit brutal acts of extreme violence and relish in the victim's pain. A DEA wiretap captured Reta and Cardona bragging about their crimes. Trevino unleashed his teenage assassins onto the streets of Laredo, Texas. What we start seeing is that the type of murders is something that we didn't see before. People being killed with, with AK-47s in broad daylight, either in the evening hours, in rush hour, uh, double homicide, over 100 shots fired in broad daylight. The high-profile murders on U.S. soil led to a multi-agency investigation involving the DEA, FBI, state, and local law enforcement. Conducting the investigations of the Setas related murders, we start seeing that they were using teams of hitmen. They were young teenagers, majority of them were U.S. citizens, that had received training, military training, in the Mexican side by the Setas to commit these types of murders. And we're talking about tactical entries into residence, tactical extractions of personnel from vehicles, counter surveillance, explosive techniques, high power uh, weapons. But after he botched a job in Mexico, Reta knew his punishment would be death. So he turned to the man who had been chasing him from the start, Detective Roberto Garcia. Facing the wrath of Miguel Trevino, Reta knew he would be safer locked up in a U.S. prison and agreed to be a witness against the Zetas. Detective Garcia was the first one to interrogate him. 
pues me gustó lo que hice. <coughs> Quebré la primera persona y me gustó. Me crié Superman a la verga. ¿Por qué? Porque ya mataba a alguien. Reta's cocky attitude and lack of remorse would bring him instant notoriety. With their tattooed faces, he and Cardona fit right into narco culture, the latest gangster fad among young people in the United States and Mexico. And in this subculture, the American baby Zetas, as some called them, were heroes, idolized by teenage wannabes. Alonso Pena grew up on the border and remembers a different world. It was a small town. There was a border patrol checkpoint there. It's probably one of the most active U.S. border patrol checkpoints in, in the United States. Uh, my Little League baseball coach was a border patrol agent. When I was growing up, I kind of idolized these guys, and that was something that sure had an influence on me if when I was growing up what I wanted to be. Pena recently retired as Deputy Director of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. He has seen the impact that the Zetas have on young people living along the border. I spoke to some school teachers that teach high school in the South Texas area, and they were telling me how concerned they were when they'd see kids come to school with Zeta markings on their notebooks, stickers or labels on their cars, graffiti. These kids were adopting those kind of symbols. You know, schools on the, our side of the border. There's no question that they have been successful in a branding of who they are and, and attracting young people to that brand. And so I worried, what are these children gonna do? And sure enough, the bad guy also was looking at the same thing. And so any job was usually a job that was illegal. And there were no other jobs available. And that's always been a concern for the border. The Zetas territory extends beyond Laredo to other border towns like Eagle Pass. This city has also seen an epidemic of child recruitment by the Zetas. Coming to get you. Bruce Ballou came to Eagle Pass three years ago to head up the juvenile probation office. The first year that I was here, we had over 40 kids arrested for felony offenses, transporting or in possession of massive quantities of uh, marijuana. And you know, the kids were poor. We're the second poorest county in the state of Texas. 60% of the people that live in this community live below poverty level. And so when people would approach these kids and pay them large sums of cash to drive for 20 minutes, drive a load up from the river, you know, it, it was a situation that kids couldn't hardly say no to. The kids and I and the probation staff built what you see here. You know, when our kids do something like this and get to stand back and say, hey, I did this deal, that's pretty sharp. That's. That's us getting involved with those kids in a way that really makes a difference. You know, we can punish them all we want to, but, in, but at the end of the day, that doesn't work. So Baloo began a diversion program to discourage kids from continuing to work for the cartels. Three years later, he's seeing positive results. We've started putting together this process and the numbers are starting to bear out. We've had a 48% decrease in felony crimes. We've had a 98% decrease in kids hauling major drug loads in this community. Give yourself a hand, guys. And kids are just better off. In July of 2013, Zeta leader Miguel Trevino was driving the infamous Carretera de la Muerte, the highway of death that our driver had showed us just days earlier. Trevino was allegedly on the way to visit his newborn son when he was arrested. After six years on the FBI's most wanted list, his reign as leader of the Zetas came to an end. But the capture of their leader had little impact on the Zetas' criminal operations, and his legacy of predatory recruitment of children continues. Rosalio Reta is now serving an 80-year sentence in a Texas prison for one of the murders he committed. His ex-wife believes he should not be held responsible for his crimes. 
Well, the people responsible in my eyes are the Satas. And they're responsible because they took a 13-year-old child, gave him a gun, and told him, it's either you, you shoot him or we're going to kill you. And at 13, that's going to put fear in anybody. They programmed him to just be heartless, a heartless killer, to not care about anybody else in the human race. And that life is not a life to get out of. Once you're in, you're in. There's no way out. Rita is lucky to be alive to tell his story. For most of the young people drawn into the narco world, the story ends in a shallow grave. This year, evidence of this massive loss of life is being uncovered in the state of Coahuila, Mexico, by a government project to locate thousands of missing persons. They recently discovered hundreds of sets of human remains, many of the bodies of children buried at narco ranches along the border. The children who somehow survived the narco world live with the nightmares of their past. It gets to a point where I can't even, I can't even stand myself. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about everything I've seen, especially that first day. I thought and I knew that one day would happen. The day that came the day, I knew God in the earth. I asked for cries within me to help me and that it would happen something else, that it would kill me, that it would kill me. Bueno, no hay inocencia ahorita. Ellos hablan mucho, por ejemplo, de muertes, de, de cómo se murió una familiar, cómo mataron a unas personas, que ellos han visto cosas muy fuertes. Dije, oh, Dios mío, que la vida del niño es muy peligrosa. Y a partir de eso, dije, voy a ayudar a cualquier joven que toque mi puerta, voy a ayudar. Mama Lupita is keeping her doors open for the new children who arrive at Casa Hogar Elim every day.